Now that we've familiarized ourselves with the contents of the Mawangdui tombs and seen some of the artifacts and texts that they held, let's explore the consciousness states that might have created these wonders. In my experience, thinking about these states can help us move more deeply into our work with both our patients and ourselves, which seems so important given these tumultuous times in which we now find ourselves. Jean Gebser, a German-Swiss philosopher, linguist, art historian, and poet, wrote about these consciousness states in his book, The Ever-Present Origin. It was first published in German in 1949. Part of the impetus for his writings stemmed from his own experiences of cataclysmic wars. He was living in Spain when the Spanish Civil War broke out in 1936 and fled to France for safety. Then, in 1939, he was just barely able to escape a German-occupied France. He got across the border into Switzerland only two hours before the border was closed. He was 34 years old at the time. His exploration of the structures of human consciousness was his way of understanding and explaining what he'd witnessed. It provided a deeper meaning and structure, beyond power, control, and political intrigue, as to why these wars had happened in the first place. He viewed the current consciousness state of the time, which is still dominant now, as being that of mental consciousness. However, he felt that it was presenting itself in a deficient fashion, as a kind of rational and causal mind state. At the same time, he also felt the presence of a new type of consciousness, which he called integral consciousness, beginning to form. He recognized its emergence through the new forms of art, literature, music, dance, mathematics, and psychology that were beginning to appear. Thus, he felt this new consciousness on the horizon as an imminent possibility. He hypothesized that the way to achieve the leap to the integral was through an acknowledgement and embracing of all the consciousness states in their most efficient forms that had occurred before. He felt that they were all always present within us, thus the name of the book, The Ever-Present Origin. In addition to the predominating mental consciousness, the past states of consciousness are archaic, magical, and mythical. Let's take a look at how he described each one of them. Let's start with archaic consciousness. The word archaic comes from the Greek word arche, which means beginning or origin. It's the basis or root of all things. From a Chinese perspective, we can think of it as the 10,000 things. It's a place of active nothingness where there rests the seeds of possibility. It's a womb-like place that's a nurturing void. In the archaic, human consciousness has not yet begun to surface. It is yet undifferentiated from the cosmos. From a five-element standpoint, we might associate the archaic state with water. The word magic and magical consciousness traces back to the ancient Persian word magus, or its plural, magi. It was the word used to describe a tribe of priests from Medes whose history goes back to the 2nd century BC. They were the religious leaders who also interpreted dreams and gave signs and omens. In the Bible, the three wise men that visited Jesus bearing gifts were from their sect. The word was later adopted by the Greeks and the Romans, where it became associated with the magical arts. From a five-element standpoint, it's akin to the wood element. Magic's earliest known reference goes all the way back to 522 BC during the time of Darius the Great of Persia. The word magi is found on the Behistun inscription shown here, a large rock relief on a cliff in western Iran that was written by Darius the Great. The trilingual inscription was crucial to the decipherment of cuneiform script, just as the Rosetta Stone enabled us to decipher Egyptian hieroglyphics. Magical consciousness is tribal, with the consciousness of the entire tribe connected to the tribal chief. The tribe is wordlessly connected to his consciousness and intuitively moves and responds, just as a school of fish effortlessly move together. In magical consciousness, there is no sense of time, 
Only the present state of now exists. There is no sense of past or future. It's a highly physical state of being with the somatic intelligence of the body taking the lead. Sound and smell dominate and are the critical senses used to take in the surrounding world. Its geometric symbol is the dot, a kind of one-dimensionality since human consciousness is just beginning to form in a dot of cohesion. This dot is also like the tip of a magic wand, a power object, which is considered to be an extension of the shaman herself who holds it. In magical consciousness, everything is interrelated. There are no coincidences, and there is no separation of spirit and matter. Rain dancing brings rain, divining reveals the truth, and drawing a slain bison on a cave wall means that it is already as good as dead, even as the men gather their arrows to go hunt it. Clinically, we find the presence of the magical through the palpation of the tendons and muscles. We listen for it in the sounds beneath people's words and in the words they leave unspoken. Here is how you might experience me from a magical perspective. You happen to notice me as I'm sitting by a stream playing a ceremonial ikara on a flute. Imagine that you've never heard my voice or actually met me. Your impressions of me are formed solely through my physical being and the sounds emanating from the flute. The word mythical in mythical consciousness originated in ancient Greece. The word mythos appeared quite early in the works of Homer written in the late 8th or early 7th century BC. It means speech, narrative, or what was used to describe the plot of a play. Other words related to it are mouth, muse, myth, and mysticism. All are relevant to mythical consciousness. Elementally, mythical consciousness is fire, like when you sit around a fire and tell stories or share your dreams. Mythical encompasses stories of beginnings like Nuwa, the mother goddess in Chinese mythology shown in this image, who's repairing the pillar of heaven to rescue the world from disruption. Or when I shared earlier the pattern on the back of the tortoise that provided the blueprint for the I Ching hexagrams. In mythical consciousness, the imagination is keenly alive. Dreams are potent and symbols are abundant. Similar to magical consciousness, everything has meaning. There are no accidents. It's a consciousness of soul awakening and poetic utterances, the language of the heart and soul. As mythical consciousness came into being, people began to have a felt sense of their own personal consciousness and emotions, and were no longer acting solely as an extension of the tribal leader. They started to explore their own inner landscapes. In mythical consciousness, the concept of time comes into being with the recognition of the cycles of nature. There's still no conception of past and future, only the turning of the seasons, the rise and fall of the sun, and the planting, growth, and harvest of the fields. The symbol of mythical consciousness is the circle, which is in keeping with the cyclical aspects of time and the seasons. The Taiji symbol represents the undulating spectrum of yin and yang and their many gradient variations. Analytic, rational, and binary this-versus-that thinking has not yet come into being. Rather, all lies upon a spectrum. Clinically, we see mythical consciousness through the sounds and emotions of the five elements, the symbols and stories of the acupuncture points, and through our patient's dreams. For my mythical introduction, here's a card from a divination deck that a friend of mine created. When I drew this card, it made so much sense to me and clearly seemed a wonderful image and metaphor about what I'm trying to manifest in my life. It's an image of an Ouroboros, an ancient alchemical symbol of a snake eating its tail. The earliest known depiction of an Ouroboros was found in a shrine enclosing the sarcophagus of Tutankhamun and dates from the 14th century BC. For me, Cosmic Ouroboros is about the work that I'm doing, such as this course that I'm presenting. It's about taking things that are ancient and old and giving them new life by talking about them and discussing what gifts they offer us. 
The word mental in mental consciousness comes from the Greek menon and the Latin mens or mentalis. It's the first word used in the Iliad and means mind, wrath, courage, and power. It heralds the formation of the ego, the separation of the individual from the multitude, and the separation of humankind from nature. It marks the beginning of directive or discursive thought. Elementally, it's metal. A crucial feature of its emergence is the shift in perspective. There's a move from a two-dimensional orientation, as illustrated by this 13th century painting, into three, as illustrated by this 15th century painting located in the Sistine Chapel. There's now awareness of space and the idea of people being separate from their surroundings. There is now foreground and background. The observer is separate from that being observed. There's a sense of detachment and objectivity. The patriarch takes power and codes of law are enacted. Right and wrong are clearly delineated. The world becomes more black and white and there's a focus on details that has a tendency to obscure the bigger picture. In Greece, where mental consciousness first made its appearance in the 5th century BC, Herodotus, an ancient Greek historian, wrote about being shocked by the differing roles between Egyptian and Athenian women. In Egypt, they were tradespeople, sat on tribunals, bought and sold real estate, inherited property, got loans, and witnessed legal documents. Not Athenian women. In his writings, Aristotle portrayed women as morally, intellectually, and physically inferior to men. He saw women as men's property and their role purely to serve them. As regards time, the 7th century Pope Sabinian ordered the ringing of the bells to note the passing hours, and the first public clock tower was erected in 1283 at the Palace of Westminster, Big Ben's precursor. Clinically, mental consciousness presents itself to us as we listen to the words and content of people's signs and symptoms. We reason out the potential causes of their ailments from a TCM standpoint. And perhaps we notice how many do not have conscious awareness in their bodies, but are locked up in their eyes. If I were to introduce myself to you from a mental consciousness standpoint, I'd hand you a copy of my resume. You would assess me by looking at my work experience, my academic degrees, and where I went to school.